Welcome to everyone to another episode of What's Up, Prof. Hello, Walter. I uh, uh, allowed you to <laughs> beat me to it today. Right, thank you so much. Giving me a chance again. How are you doing? Uh, no, we're hanging on. We're on autopilot. We're going on. The war is raging relentlessly, but the ship has to carry on, right? Finished. And you just stay in the ship and you hold on for dear life. Yes, <laughs> yes. The waves are trying to knock us off, but uh, we'll carry on. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Emily Father, it's such a privilege to work for you, and we thank you for that. Therefore, now we ask that you bless this discussion again, bless the viewers, and enlighten our minds with the Holy Spirit to discern the right from wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Martin, this is part two of the economy of Francesco, because obviously it's not only about economy, right? No. There are attachments. You know, it's like we said in the previous one. There's so much happening here and there and everywhere, and it looks disjointed. Yes. But it's all interlinked. I was talking to a pastor, and he was extremely irate because uh, we are so presumptuous as to think that the Jesuits have anything to do with world events. And, uh, you know, they're just uh, a kind-hearted people that take care of soup kitchens. Mm. That's what they do. It's strange to me that uh, some people still haven't realized that they are the advisors to presidents and kings, economies, and you name it. Their, their fingers are like tentacles that uh, reach every facet of humanity. And it is mind-boggling to me that in spite of the Reformation, 500 years plus of Reformation, in spite of the Great Awakening, 1844 and onwards, in spite of the Word of God, people still think that there's nothing unusual going on in the world and everything that is considered in harmony with this Word must be a conspiracy. It is mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. And also, a lot of people are on different sidetracks. Yes. Because, like you just mentioned, if you realize and you do the real study, you see that the Jesuits are be above all of this. Yes. And they sometimes go off on these sidetracks, and then Zionism becomes the, the problem. Enemy, this any, everybody becomes the enemy, and the Antichrist is still coming or has come. It's a certain person. It's ridiculous. If you can just stick to what history, spirit of prophecy, and the Bible tells you, yes. you can't go wrong. Absolutely. So let's continue with our study and see what the add-on features are and where we are heading. And then we must remember that Jesus said that we must study the signs, the signs of the times. And the signs of the times tell us where we are in the stream of time. And uh, when we do that study and we do the collation, then we have to come to the conclusion that we are at the end. Yes. Now remember we had these verses on the screen in our last study. And uh, we spoke about Revelation chapter 17. We don't have to go into it in any detail because we did it last time in part one. But the ten horns, as we discussed, will receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So they will rule together. So this is a universal conglomerate where the beast power, which has been defined as the Roman system, will be in cahoots, working in tangent with the kings of the world. And their object is eventually to make war with the Lamb. Mm. And in case anybody misses the point here, the Bible again reiterates in verse 18, and the woman which thou sawest, and a woman is always a church in a prophetic context, is that great city. And last time we said there's only one church that identifies itself as a city, and that's Rome. Yes. 
which reigneth over the kings of the earth. If you deny this simple statement in the Bible, you'll miss the plot. That's the thing. Then you're all over the place looking for what, how to fit this in the prophetic vision no. picture. Can it be clearer? No. It is crystal clear, and yet people deny it. They're looking for a future individual who, when the Antichrist system is a woman, it is a church that has also a political aspect. Therefore, it is also a beast. Yes, and its mission is to denigrate God's law. And it has to make war with the Lamb. And if those come together, you have to ask yourself, is there a woman? Is there a church? So that is a city. And the answer is yes. Does it war against God? Well, yes. If it wars against the word, it wars against the lamb. And if it wars against the lamb, it wars against God's people. That's it. Did this church persecute and destroy millions of lives in the Reformation and before and after? And the answer is historically, yes. How blind must you be if you persist in ignoring it? Mm -hmm. We also had this slide in the first one. Why the economy of Francesco can develop a new economics and create a better world. And this was from the National Catholic Reporter. And basically, they're talking about the social teaching of the Roman Catholic Church and that the other confessions, including the Grand Imam Sheikh Ahmed El Tayeb of al Zar University, and Pope Francis have combined their forces to substantiate the idea that there is unity amongst them with regard to this issue. Mm -hmm. That is where we ended our discussion, basically, in our part one, which dealt largely with the economic changes, but now we're going to talk about the add-ons. Yes. Where is this heading? Because and it all is... They have, a, they have a master plan. And if you, if you don't know where this is heading, then you yes. can again go on, on sidetracks. Now, let's just reiterate. How do we know what the master plan is? Because we have a blueprint. That's it. And where's the blueprint? In the Word of God. It's in this book. Mm -hmm. The great city that rules over the kings of the world. This is the insider, and this was from December 8, 2020. So this has been in the pipeline for a while. And it said there, Pope Francis joins with CEOs of Fortune 500 companies to form a new council focused on creating a more equitable economy. Now, we dealt with this mm -hmm. in a previous WhatsApp prof, and we discussed this issue in quite some detail. Just to reiterate a point here, is the Roman Catholic Church directly involved in the economy? Yes. It's, so already it's a church involved in politics. All right. Question number two, is this just a, a passing interest or do they play a leading role? Leading role because all these people go to visit the Pope. Oh, the Pope doesn't go and visit them to see what they are doing and out of interest. No, they come to him and the plans are forged in that milieu. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you just look at it like this, this was in December 2020. And what happened now in the previous WhatsApp prophet that we showed? Yes. Now the economy is doing exactly what he's been proposing the whole time. All right. So if he is a woman... And she's a church. And a church is supposed to represent religious interests. Now, if you're going to integrate them, then the religious and the political interests become one. Is that right? Yes. What was it like in the Middle Ages? The political and the religious interests were one. What happened in the past if a king refuse to follow the religious dictates of this power. That power could get rid of the king. So he was deposed. Yes. Yes, he was excommunicated. So once again, he was free to rule under the um, dictates of Salmaneser, which is this church power. Exactly. So this has been the situation throughout history. 
It's been hidden lately, ever since that uh, power moved up out of the bottomless pit. It has been working in darkness, but now it's coming to the fore. So let's just make sure about that. It says here, the move towards a kind of capitalism just got religious. Is religion and the economy coming together? Definitely. Whose economy? Whose religion? Francisco's. Francisco's. So the CEOs of the Bank of America, Visa, EY, BP, Johnson & Johnson, the whole lot of these people, joined forces with Pope Francis to promote a more inclusive form of capitalism in a new organization called the Council for Inclusive Capitalism with the Vatican. Is that a clear prophetic picture? 100%. You, it fits perfectly in what the Bible tells you. All right. Now, if you take the Bible and you open up chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, are the merchants very prominent in that chapter? Yes. And when this system finally comes to a fall, doesn't it say in Revelation chapter 18 that the merchants will weep and wail? And that the captains of the ships, which stand for the economy, will weep and wail and stand afar off and see her demise? Mm -hmm. Well, they have joint forces. Is that therefore a fulfillment of biblical prophecy? Yes. Let's read further. The member companies of the new council represent more than $10.5 trillion in assets under management. Companies with over 2.1 trillion of market capitalization, 200 million workers, and over 163 councils. This council will follow the warning from Pope Francis to listen to the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Have we got add ons here, Martin? That's it. You've got climate and social. So we're, we're joining them all together. Is this a fulfillment of prophecy? Once again, yes. Because doesn't the Bible also say that God will deal with those who destroy the earth? Mm -hmm. no, let's not go too far in that direction. And answer society's demands for a more equitable and sustainable model of growth. So said uh, Lynn Forrester de Rothschild, founder of the Council and Managing Partner of Inclusive Capital Partners. Rothschild. In uh, German, that is Rothschild, mm -hmm. Red Shield. And the Red Shield was the shield of the Roman army. You know, when they attacked, they put the Red yeah. Shield over their heads and they formed a solid uh, sheet whereby they approached cities to invade them, etc. And if you look into some of the encyclopedias, they will tell you that the Rothschilds are Vatican bankers. Yeah. Well, very interesting. Everything links again. To Everything them. links to Rome. And the Jesuits, who are apparently, according to some, only interested in soup kitchens, but run all the major universities of the world on the side and all the political systems on the other, Let's see what they have to say in their journal of October 4, 2021. Pro Francis and 40 faith leaders call for urgent action to combat climate change. Future generations will never forgive us. In an unprecedented response to the grave threat facing all peoples worldwide from climate change, Pope Francis and some 40 faith leaders representing the world's major religions have joined in an appeal for urgent action. So, just to reiterate, is the church the driving force behind the climate action as well? Definitely. In the previous article, it also came to the fore. So, with the economic and merchants of the, the economic powers and the merchants. It is also ensconced their climate. So if they control the kings of the world? It's interesting, the Bible talks about kings of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we've had programs in the past, or we've had some lectures, where it's very interesting to see that every single president of the United States had royal lineage, right? Mm -hmm. And only those that had this royal lineage ever got near the presidency. Mm -hmm. 
But be that as it may. So they control the political system. They're involved in the economic system. And here, together with other faith leaders, with them playing the leading role, we have the climate agenda, mm. which, of course, has other add-ons. Yes. Vatican News, March 25, 2022. Pope consecrates Russia and Ukraine. Spiritual act of trust amid a cruel war. And Martin, this war has been raging for a month and a half. And it's still raging. And there is no solution. Uh, I don't want to sound facetious, but is it possible that there shouldn't be a quick resolution to it so that certain things can come into place, fall into place? Yep. They procrastinating. Okay. Pope Francis consecrates all humanity, especially Russia and Ukraine, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and says the act expresses our complete trust in the Virgin Mary in the midst of the cruel and senseless war in Ukraine. Now, I don't think it's necessary for us to go into the merit of consecrating anything to Mary because according to the scripture Mary is asleep and totally unaware of anything that is going on in this world mm -hmm. right now. The dead know nothing. The only dead that are in heaven are those that have had special resurrections and those that have been translated without seeing death and that is a handful. But uh, Mary is not in that list. So obviously, this is a strategy, and Mary is actually an acronym for another power. Yeah, hmm? that's it. Right, let's not go too far into that. So the Pope's renewal of the consecration came in response to the war in Ukraine and at the request of the Blessed Virgin Mary made in an apparition at Fatima, on the 13th of July, 1970. Now, we don't want to go into great detail with that either. But this has been planned for a very long time. And by the way, in 1917, uh, you had the Great Revolution, which produced the current communist system mm. uh, that you have in Russia. Yeah, the Bolshevik. Revolution. The Bolshevik Revolution. And that was also in 1917. And then, of course, the Jesuits were the one who perfected communism in their reductions mm -hmm. in South America. So, again, we're all interconnected here. So, Pope Francis recalled the, that God chose the Virgin Mary to change history by beginning a new story of salvation and peace. Confession is the sacrament of joy, he said. The Lord enters our home as he did that of Mary and Nazareth and brings us unexpected amazement and joy. The Pope also urges priests to always express God's forgiveness in confession and never project an air of rigidity or harshness. He sounds so genteel. But Martin, this is, this is not even biblical. No, because he's making this confession to a priest and to Mary the same as what you have to do to Jesus. Yes, and to conjure, let's use that word in the negative sense, to conjure peace mm. by consecrating Russia to Mary does make absolutely no biblical sense whatsoever. So this is not godly. It looks... Because it's a church and he's doing this, oh, this is nice and it's godly. This is a blasphemy. This, this is basically a blasphemy, but it is Roman theology. Mm. And the world is accepting it. Yes. Do you hear any protest from the Protestant churches? No, they probably joined in it. There were many that were present when this consecration took place. And whether they agreed with it in their minds or not, that is their business. But in any case, this is a Roman theology, 
which is not shared by any Protestant denomination, and yet they go along with it. Mm. By their silence, they condone it. Well, Pope Francis, considering a trip to Kiev, slams Russian invasion as infantile. So Martin, if he says it's infantile, then who's the adult here? He is. <laughs> he is the adult. I like the, the choice of words that these people have. Once again, some potentate sadly caught up in anachronistic claims of nationalist interests. Now, there again, if you want to push globalism, you have to denigrate nationalism. That's it. We heard that also in that meeting that we showed in the first in the previous episode. Yes. They were also talking about that one guy was talking there and saying nationalism has to go, sovereignism has to go. Absolutely. This is where they're heading. So it this is provoking and fermenting conflict, whereas ordinary people sense the need to build a future that will either be shared or not be at all, the Pope said. Does that sound like an ultimatum? Yes. You either get rid of nationalism or there will be no future. That's what he's saying. So the remarks came after Pope Francis said he cons considering an invitation made by Ukraine political and religious authorities to visit the embattled capital of Kiev. Yes, it is on the table, the pontiff said, offering no further details. So here is the great mediator of our day. Yes, and but he's like we showed in a, a previous episode, he's on both sides. Yes, he is referring to Putin, but he's also in contact with him. He calls him and all of that. And like we showed, he's gone to visit him many, many times. And he's now here talking about uh, Ukraine. So again there, we saw the political and the religious world working together because they both invited him, right? You... We are on a stage where you cannot separate the religious from the political anymore. They've become integrated. It is. If you take the United States, Biden and his whole administration are Catholic and they push this religious part very strongly. Yes. So here's the United Arab Emirates, Israel, and the United States launch a religious coexistence group to promote interfaith dialogue. So... These are political powers that are integrating themselves with religious powers. That's church and state. That's the image of the beast, right? Mm -hmm. So the religious working group is another direct outcome of the historic Abraham Accord. Its establishment was announced last October at the first trilateral meeting of the foreign ministers of all three countries. The declaration of the Abraham Accords, signed in September 2020, encouraged efforts to promote interfaith and intercultural dialogue to advance a culture of peace amongst the three Abrahamic religions and all humanity. Tolerance and coexistence are the path to our shared humanity and peace, Stern continued. The Abraham Accords have shattered long standing paradigms, and now it is our duty to build on them, and widen the circle of peace regionally and globally. Through these meetings of the Abrahamic faith to send a clear message of reconciliation, acceptance, and inclusion. Why is that important? Because Jesus said he did not come to bring peace. But a sword and division. And he also said, or the Bible says, peace and safety, then sudden destruction. All right, so when they bring about this peace by the reconciliation, acceptance, and inclusion, that means that a religion, Abrahamic religion as they claim, that includes Jesus Christ as the Messiah, becomes reconciled, accepted, and inclusive with religions that reject Jesus as the Messiah. Mm -hmm. Then who's the stumbling stone then? Jesus. Jesus is the stumbling stone. And when they finally come together, what did Revelation 17 say would be their objective? To war against the Lamb. Martin, 
This is a war against Christ. That's it. And it's a war against the word. So if it is a war against Christ and against his word, then who is the ultimate instigator of that war? Satan. Satan. Mm -hmm. So that beast that rises up out of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 11 introduces a world post-French Revolution ideology mm -hmm. which becomes the accepted norm of society. It slowly but surely removes the Bible and the Protestant faith out of the center and replaces it with another religious system which is totally foreign yeah. to biblical principles. That's it. And, but it looks good. It looks so good and it has such nice words associated with it. But we'll see where it's heading. So you cannot deny that scripture is being fulfilled here. Now, let's see whether the Jesuits, who apparently only run soup kitchens, according to some theological uh, entities that I've had discussions with. Vatican News, Jesuit Superior General. As citizens, we work for the good of Europe. One of the things that seem most important to me today is to strengthen the sense of planetary citizenship. This is the head of the Jesuit order. This is the general. Mm, this is the black pope. Yes. That is, it is not a problem of the Ukrainians. It's not a problem of the Russians. It is not a problem of the European Union. It is our problem as citizens of the world. As citizens, we must push politics in the direction of the common good. Of course, a war like this is against citizenship, against people's well-being, against the well-being of nature too. So doing politics is very important from a personal point of view as a citizen and also to support this. So do they admit that they are involved in politics? <laughs> Definitely. For example, the feeling of public opinion is very important at the moment. And Martin, who sways public opinion? They do. How? By the media, Jesuit theater, all the waves that can enter your senses. Okay, so they use all the senses. I wonder whether they studied the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola to make sure that they indoctrinate you properly, right? Mm -hmm. But all this will not succeed if you don't have strong support from the citizens in the world and in Europe. Now, I find it interesting that he, he lifts Europe up all the time. Isn't this part of the Ten Kings? Ten Kings. Now, here's a very interesting discussion or chat. And this is the J.D. Rucker show. And let's just see what this man has to say. And uh, it's important because uh, we have to see whether our thinking is a, a to totally isolated form of thinking or whether others have also started realizing what's happening in That's the it. world. Is it um, only us that are bringing this message or other people waking up? I actually think that this is way bigger than our federal health agencies and our, and our president right now and our past president. But I do think they're all being influenced by the same organization that is orchestrating this entire plan. I actually think, and I'm hoping, I'm very hopeful that they're not going to win, actually. Uh, but, I have to tell you, uh, but I am concerned that no one is acknowledging who the real threat is. I actually think... Uh, and it's, it's not to, like I'm just making this up. I'm just going to tell you as much rap, much, much research as I do, as much looking into individuals and what they're saying, watch what they're saying, and then see who else is also saying the same thing. I actually think the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope, Pope Francis, is over this entire thing. And I think he's manipulating, controlling the entire narrative. I think he's got Anthony Fauci in his pocket. I think he's got Joe Biden, Donald Trump, uh, Francis Collins. I think all of them 
are being controlled by a division of the Roman Catholic Church called the Order of the Jesuits, whose sole mission for the last 200 years, I'm aware of, since 1857, they have been plotting to destroy the Constitution of the United States as the one last stronghold of a country that preserves and protects religious freedoms. And I think they want to, I think they've been plotting this whole time in many ways, either through wars, now through famine, now through uh, pandemics. I think it has been a, a complete attempt of them to destroy the Constitution of the United States from within, to destroy the borders, to reduce, which is what they've said. We also have to reduce militaries of all countries, demolish all borders of countries so we can create a one world religion with the Pope as the one world leader. Uh, and if you are not listening to what Joe Biden said, what Anthony Fauci is saying, what Walensky at the CDC is saying, what Donald Trump is saying, they're all saying the same thing. And they're all doing the same thing. <laughs> they are pushing for vaccines and then following what the Pope said that it's important for us last month, just so you know, December, sorry, December 2021, the Pope came out and said, who is a Jesuit Pope for the first time in Roman Catholic history, this Jesuit Pope, Pope Francis said, there's only two things the world needs right now. The world needs to defund all of their militaries and reduce their personnel. And then the second thing the whole world needs is more vaccinations. Uh, well, what is Joe Biden doing? Joe Biden is absolutely showing you, we'll just remove the military from Afghanistan. We will threaten mandates on the military. Who cares if 200,000 of them say they're going to walk off? This is reducing military. This is what he's doing. This is the attempt to do it. He opened up the borders, letting people flood in. It's exactly what the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church have always wanted. So, um, if, and if you don't realize what the religion of Mexico is, who's flooding our borders right now from the South, it is Catholic. In the Catholic doctrines, they have stated that we need to flood America with Catholics. And we need to put Jesuits in position of political power in the government to destroy the constitution from within. This is since 1857, by the way. Now, Anthony Fauci went to a Jesuit high school and a Jesuit college. So did Joe Biden, he went to Fordham University. So did Donald Trump, he went to Fordham University too and the University of Pennsylvania, which are both mega Jesuit universities. Francis Collins in 2015, who's Anthony Fauci's boss, was flown to Rome and Pope Francis actually made him chair over the Papacy's Science Academy of the world in Rome. That's Anthony Fauci's boss. All right. If you don't see the connection and the ties to the Pope and these guys in the Jesuit order, whose whole mission has been since the 1500s with Loyola, who set it up, the order of the Jesuits, it has been to create a one world religion, a one world government with the Pope at the head. And uh, anyway, that is uh, that to me is who's in charge and no one's really acknowledging it. But uh, I absolutely believe if you just listen to what they're saying, and I'll, I'll just say right now, people talk about how much they love Donald Trump and they think he's going to save this country. Uh, when they come out, if you haven't listened to him lately, it's been driving me nuts because I voted for him twice and thought he was what I thought he was. I think he's just a part of this whole script that they're being given to create mass confusion and civil war in the country. That's what they're doing. That's what Donald Trump and this guy are doing, Joe Biden and his administration. Martin, I don't think we need to add anything to that, do we? No. Hmm? No, I think he said basically what we have been saying the whole time. So he's looking at the signs, he's looking at who's saying what. And he's putting the links together. And he's not even using the word. No. So in other words, just by looking at the signs, you can already connect the dots. How much more so if you have the signs? Yeah. How much more so? It's because then you get behind the whole reason for all of it. Yes. Then why are we all so quiet about this? Why aren't we all up in arms on the barricades warning the world that we are in the final moments of Earth's history? Why don't we do that? Maybe we're scared that we are going to be proved wrong. We've already been proved right. That's the thing. <laughs> and even if after all of this, it turns out to be a little bit different, I'm glad that we have done it like this. Yes. So, Martin, where does all this lead? All this leads to the climate agenda. And then the next question, and where does the climate agenda lead us? Then you have the full circle, right? Here is an article from the 3rd of April, 2022. UN Chief Guterres acts to ensure private companies obey climate orders. 
It doesn't matter whether there's a war raging. It doesn't matter whether there is a pandemic raging. This agenda goes forward, whether in the background or in the foreground, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen. It is, and everything's linked back to it. So the United Nations Secretary General has appointed a panel led by Canada's former Environment Minister to ensure private companies obey climate directives with every business, investor, city, state and region targeted for compliance by the globalist body. Does this sound uh, very assertive? Mm. Mm. You better do it or else. Does it sound like that? Yeah. Okay, we also urgently need every business, investor, city, state and region to walk the talk on their net zero promises, Guterres warned. In addition to examining net zero pledges by the private sector, the group will hold local and regional governments to account even if they don't report directly to the UN. So... Are they pushing their agenda at every sec single level? Definitely. Even if you're not part of them, if they, you're not even acknowledged there, you're going to be... You're going to have to do this, right? Now, Martin, the Bible says, surely we have inherited lies. So how can you build a solid structure on a foundation of lies? Well, they are the masters at doing it. What does the Bible say happens to those that build on sand? It will be swept away. <laughs> That's right. That's what the Bible says. Now, Martin, we've said many times that uh, we, we look at the, the science from both sides and the numbers that they crunch and the numbers that they present in terms of climate change are as far removed from reality as the East is from the West. And if you dare to say something on this issue, well, then you are a conspiracy theorist, right? Yeah, well, it's even worse. You don't even have to say something. If you just show proof, you're already in the trouble. Then you're already in trouble. Now, in the past, we've shown some of the most prominent climatologists uh, expose this ridiculous scenario that the world is being presented with. And every now and then we show that thousands of scientists disagree with the common narrative. And uh, just to be consistent in our approach, let this gentleman give his pound of flesh as well. Let's listen to what this man has to say. First, can you tell us a little bit about your temperature measurements? There are five main ones around the world. What makes yours special and what have you found? Well, the global temperature data set that John Christie and I started uh, over 30 years ago, uh, it, it, the, the advantage to it is that it's from satellites and it covers the whole Earth. There's no other uh, temperature data set that covers the whole Earth. It only goes back to 1979, so we can only talk about uh, how much warming there has been in the last 43 years in that data set. But that is the period when it was supposed to be warming the most. What sort of warming have we had? Is it in line, for instance, with the predictions from the climate models of 10, 15, 20 years ago that we face a climate crisis with very dangerous rises already in the planet's temperature? Well, if we do a comparison, an apples to apples comparison between the satellite measurements, uh, which are actually of a fairly deep layer of the atmosphere, okay, uh, that's where most of our weather occurs, is, is in the troposphere, the lowest part of the atmosphere. And if we do an apples to apples comparison between the satellite measurements and what over two dozen climate models have predicted since 1979, uh, for that same layer, we, our measurements are actually at the bottom end of all those models. In other words, the warming we see is lower than most, if not all of those models. So there is a discrepancy between what the, what the observations are showing, which shows about a, an average of 0.13 degrees C per decade warming, which is, you know, a very small number, 
uh, compared to the climate models, which are generally, oh, twice that at least. Your kind of measurements uh, have been upsetting to people that want us to believe there's a climate emergency happening, climate crisis, existential. Uh, and Google has now demonetized your site, claiming it makes unreliable and harmful claims. Which claims have they told you are unreliable and harmful? Well, they're not specific about what claims. They're basically, it says the whole, they're, the, what their uh, website tells me is that all of my whole website is, uh, basically is unreliable and harmful claims. Let me tease out exactly that because I find this amazing, but also very sinister. So the people who run Google, who aren't climate scientists, have punished your website, and you are a scientist, one of the leading climate scientists in the world, measuring the world's temperature. They've punished your site without saying exactly why, what you've done wrong, claiming you are unreliable and harmful. Because, it seems to me, simply because your data indicates the planet isn't warming as much as alarmists have said. Well, Martin, you can't get clearer than this. So Dr. Roy Spencer, a meteorologist of some repute, uh, knows less than Google. And he's just showing the data. Yes. So actually Google is saying that the data is unreliable. So on what, what do you work with then? <laughs> well, fortunately, the Bible says that the refuge of lies will be swept away. So let's just put it bluntly. They've built the foundation of sand. Personally, I think it's quicksand. Mm. And they're building this lofty structure on it, and the whole world must comply. But the real foundation, the real foundation stone, they have rejected. Yes. So we are exactly where we were at the destruction of Jerusalem. Shall we ask the Jesuits, what they rue most. What, what is their, their big sadness? What, why were the Jesuits instituted? Why were they formed? What was their purpose? To destroy Protestantism. That was their objective. And of course, to destroy the Protestant Bible. And uh, it's always fascinating to me how they have succeeded to a large extent to actually do that. Mm -hmm. And how they have helped establish Protestant religious systems that don't actually need the Word of God anymore because uh, they rely on the feelings and the spiritual inputs mm -hmm. that they receive when they're actually admonished to test their spiritual inputs by the Word of God. Yes, because it's so blatant these days. The Spirit has told me to do this and that. Yes. And it's in, not in harmony with what the Word says. So it's not built on a solid foundation. It's going to be swept away together with the refuge of lies. So this man, a Jesuit, he writes here, an article, COVID-19, Global Warming and the Diminishing Catholic Guilt. Uh, why is the Catholic guilt diminishing? You see, Martin, the Catholic Church ruled supreme in the Middle Ages. And then with the Reformation, eventually it lost some of its power. And then with the the new liberal way of thinking, separating church and state, it lost some more of its power. And the Jesuits, who are ultramontanists and want to reestablish that papal supremacy, have to bring the Roman church back into the center and put it back into the position that it was before, when it had absolute power. So for a couple of centuries now, there has been this Roman Catholic guilt that has been placed upon them by the Protestants because of the Inquisition, because of all of these things. But you know, Martin, they have succeeded in rewriting the history books. Yes. They have succeeded in changing the encyclopedias, and they've used 
their organizations, like the Knights of Malta, like the Jesuit Order, they have infiltrated the media world and they have rewritten history. So if you want to know about history, it's good to have some moldy books. Mm. So why is the Catholic guilt diminishing and what is it that these people want back? Well, this is a Jesuit writing and he says, COVID-19 and global warming are enough to make me long for the days of clerical power and Catholic guilt. Well, diminishing Catholic guilt. When they were not guilty, when they ruled, he's longing for those days. In those good, bad old days, the church's hierarchy was able to issue thunderous edicts and most Catholics would follow its directions like sheep. If the laity did not, they would feel guilty and fear going to hell. The church used to have the power to make and break kings, the power to shape cultures and command people's actions. Too bad it does not have such power to save humanity from itself today. Doesn't that sound like a Jesuit? Yes. Longing for the Inquisition again? But maybe I can say to him that I don't think it's far off. (laughs) Well, actual fact, he probably knows. Like uh, Quigley said, the world is run by a handful of elites, of which he is one. And he was a Jesuit. Would that the Pope could declare vaccine skeptics and climate change deniers heretics and put their books, articles, Facebook pages and tweets on the index of forbidden books. But doesn't he control Google and Twitter and mm. all of these? Yes. Hasn't he placed them on the index of forbidden books exactly. or forbidden news? Just like that. Didn't we just see the previous speaker being removed by Google? Yeah, <laughs> from being a climatologist and knowing his oats. Yeah, and putting the data that is actually there out in the open. So this is the system that we must now trust. And uh, if only the Pope had the power to declare these people heretics, how wonderful it would be. Well, he's already doing it. Yeah, they're doing it because they, you're conspiracy theorists. That's just a new name for heretic. That's right. This would be quite a change from the days when Galileo and Darwin were considered heretics. This time, clerical power would be backing up science. Haven't we heard that? Mm -hmm. So actually the science has changed now because this science that we've just shown of the previous meteorologist, that's not science. No, We'll have to get to the other science, the science. If I may be a little bit facetious, It is the Jesuit order and the Jesuit science who came up with the Big Bang Theory. And based on the Big Bang Theory and evolution and all the evolutionary hoaxes, like uh, the falsification of human skulls by Jesuits such as Pierre Teilhard de Chardin in most probability, and the whole evolutionary scenario as it is mixed up with uh, science today, we had a whole... Talk on science falsely so-called, remember? Yes. Okay. So that's the kind of science, Big Bang, evolution, etc., that we must follow. Well, I think that they're in for a surprise because their science that is based on these philosophies will sooner or later experience a Big Bang. (laughs) I heard another um, saying that Yes, there was a big bang. When God spoke everything into existence, it was with a bang. (laughs) You're right. Nothing would give me more illicit pleasure than having the governors of Florida and Texas, along with the leaders of the oil and coal industries, excommunicated just as kings and nobles were excommunicated in the past. This Jesuit is reminiscing. He wants the good old days. He wants the good old, bad old days back. And rather than organizing crusades against Muslims, as it did in the past, the church could mobilize its people to protect the health of the earth and humanity. But today, the children's crusade is led not by the church, but by Greta Thunberg. Hopefully, she will be more successful than the children's crusade of 1212 
which ended in disaster. There was a time when Christianity had the ability to do great things, some good, some bad. We marvel at those Christians in the past who dug the foundations of the great cathedrals, the completion of which they and their children would never see. The idea of taking on a project like building a cathedral that might take centuries to complete is incomprehensible to us. Today we find it impossible to make sacrifices, wear masks. That's a sacrifice, Martin. Did you know that? That will benefit us in a few months. It's amazing that all the young children that are forced to wear them are no longer able to articulate words. Yeah, they can't speak. Let alone make sacrifices, cut carbon emissions, that will benefit our children in future decades. Pope Francis, in his 2015 encyclical Laudato Si, called the world to individual and systemic conversion to prevent the disaster that is quickly approaching. There are some who have responded, such as the Laudato Si movement, formerly known as the Global Catholic Climate Movement. But millions of us are going about our business, worrying about our daily lives, while Catholic bishops and elites, myself included, he includes himself as an elite modern, argue about the Latin mass, communion for politicians, and grinder, rather than the coming climate apocalypse. Grinder. Do you know what that is about? If I'm not mistaken, it's about sexuality. Yes, it's about alternative sexuality. Uh, it seems that this is part of the Jesuit agenda as well. Francis is right. We need both individual and systemic conversion. Our lifestyles must change and our carbon-based economic system must change. We must turn the thermostat up in the summer and down in the winter. We must recycle and use less energy. But we also need government regulations and carbon tax so that the entire economic system becomes less carbon dependent. This will not be easy, but it must be done. The church has lost its clerical power, so I guess we will have to depend on Catholic guilt. But this time, the hell we face will be of our own making. So he laments the fact that the church cannot just command and it is done. But he probably knows, being part of the elite, mm -hmm. that it actually does command and it is being done. It is being done. It's just not so forceful that like, like it used to be. It's much more sinister. Now, let's put this into a religious perspective. Mm -hmm. The truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. And Protestantism set the world free from Catholic tyranny. Mm -hmm. And since Protestantism has established itself, the world was called the free world, the Protestant world. But now, unfortunately, these Jesuits long for the times of papal tyranny so that they can use the refuge of lies that they've built up and force everyone into the direction that they want. And the kings of the world will give their power unto the beast. Here's another article from America, the Jesuit Review, The Great Resignation and the Spirituality of Work. The Catholic tradition has consistently valued the right to rest and specifically a regular weekly rest comprising at least Sunday to devote to worship of God, care for the loved ones and recreation. In a society that has largely abandoned the Sabbath rest, the great resignation may point anew to the sacredness of renewal time. Can we de-link this religious agenda from their other agendas? No. And this is where it's culminating towards. Everything is leading to this. So, Martin, this seems like a huge program to eventually attack God's authority. That's it. Isn't this what it's all mm -hmm. about? A fresh fear that emerges with this new appreciation for leisure is that the modern world no longer understands meaningful rest. 
One day of rest is no panacea for those stretched too thin to make ends meet. Before you read on, I think it's also important to realize that eventually they will move towards this rest, not only being for recreation. There has to be some holiness towards it. Aha, uh-huh, some religious connotations. Yes, and that will also come through in this article. Let's have a look. So let's read the bolded portion. The latest available American Time Use survey from the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that in 2020, Americans spent on average over three hours a day watching television. People ages 20 to 24 spent on average an additional 1.4 hours daily playing computer games. Rest should recreate. Strengthen laborers for work and foster loving bonds of faith, family, and friendship. The great resignation, while prompting reconsideration of work, must also prompt reconsideration of holy leisure. So you're quite right, Martin. That's exactly what they're saying. Yeah, so it's not just about, okay, I'm resting on a Sunday. I'm playing a lot of computer games and watching movies. No, no. They want a religious part to it as well. All right. So is worship involved then? Definitely. Now, here's an interesting comparison about the definition of Sunday in the dictionary. I was driving in my car, and I had someone in my car who was doing a a job for me, and I had to take him to a specific place. I didn't know the person, but uh, when I have some time to speak to someone and you only have one opportunity, I have this habit of trying to steer the conversation in a religious direction so that one can address certain things. And so we were driving along and I had this chat with the man and uh, I asked him, you know, where does he worship, etc. And I spoke a little bit about what we do. And uh, then the issue of Saturday, Sunday came up. And he said, yes, he goes to church on Sundays, etc., etc. And I said, yes, but you know, I go to church on a Saturday. Now you have an opening wedge. Why do you go to church on a Saturday? I said, because the Bible says uh, Saturday is the seventh day of the week. And he said, no, Sunday is the seventh day of the week. I said, no, it's not. Sunday is the first day of the week. So he was very interested, so he took his his phone and he Googled it to see what uh, Mr. Google (laughs) would tell him about Sunday. And no matter where he looked, Sunday was nowhere to be found as the first day of the week. And I told him that uh, the good old dictionary is defined it as the first day of the week. So he looked up uh, on Google, the Oxford Dictionary, and it said day following Saturday. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't find that definition anymore. And some of them were so ridiculous that they even said you could choose whether it was the first or the seventh. So let's read some of these definitions in the the dictionaries. And... uh, Martin, you said these were all internet? Yes, this is all online dictionaries. I got this online. So. These are all online yeah. dictionaries, so these are not hard online. copies from the olden days. Yeah. So the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and by the way, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary has roots in a very strong Protestant belief system. Saturday, the seventh day of the week. That's perfectly correct. Sunday, the first day of the week, the Christian analog of the Jewish Sabbath. Now, of course, there is no such thing as a Jewish Sabbath because the seventh day Sabbath comes from Genesis. Yes, creation. Yes. And therefore, it cannot be an analog. No, it's for all humanity. It's for all humanity. Cambridge Dictionary, the day of the week after Friday for Saturday. So Saturday is the day of the week after Friday and before Sunday. And if you go 
to what is Sunday, the day of the week after Saturday and before Monday, when most people in Western countries do not go to work. <laughs> now, Martin, these are no longer definitions. Mm. No. A definition is to define what something is. This will constitute circular, circular reasoning eventually because every weekday you'll just say it's before and after the one after and the one before. Yes, and it's, it doesn't qualify as a definition because it is only defined in terms of something else, but not in terms of itself. So I don't know whether these online dictionaries have lost the art of being dictionaries. Macmillan Dictionary, the day after Friday and before Sunday. It's interesting how long the Sunday definitions are. Isn't that interesting? So this one says, the day after Saturday and before Monday, usually considered to be the first day of the week in the US and the last day of the week in the UK. In Western countries, most people do not work on Sunday. So it seems as if they do not know whether it's the first day or the last day. Now, now what they've done now is they make it a choosing. It's a day of choice. Yes, a day of choice. Countries can choose, is this the first or the second or the seventh day or whatever. Yes, and when you pick up a calendar these days, mm -hmm. it might start with a Sunday as the first day of the week, but uh, in most cases, probably not. It no, will start with like Monday. You, like they've just mentioned here. Probably in the US, you'll find Sunday as the first day on the calendars, and in the UK, you're going to find Monday as the first day. Now, here's the Oxford Online Dictionary. It says the same thing, the day of the week before Sunday and following Friday and forming part of the weekend. Excuse me, Oxford Dictionary Online, but that's pathetic. This I also got from the app that you can download on your phone. Okay. The, uh, the Sunday definition says the day of the week before Monday and following Saturday observed by Christians as a day of rest and religious worship and forming part of the weekend. Really? This might be so that many Christians keep it as uh, the Sabbath, but that doesn't make it the Sabbath. Mm. Then dictionary.com says the seventh day of the week following Friday for Saturday, so that's correct. And uh, the Sunday, they say, the first day of the week observed as the Sabbath by most Christian sects. So the Sunday definitions are very long, and they make sure that they tell you that this is the day of worship for Christians. Mm -hmm. Now, Martin, I have some older dictionaries here. I have some better ones even. I even have an Oxford dictionary and a German dictionary over here. This is Longman Active Study Dictionary of English. And let me read what it says for Sunday. It says here, Sunday, the first day of the week, the day between Saturday and Monday. So they tell you that it is the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. So this dictionary still has a definition of what the word is, Sunday. This one over here, is the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary. So this is Oxford. Yeah. All right. Let's see if they know so what they... Sunday is. Let me just find it here. Sunday, the first day of the week, coming before Monday, a day of rest and worship for Christians. So they have it correct. Not... So in their own line anymore. No, but their online dictionary is no longer a dictionary because it cannot define the word, only in terms of something else. So just to make sure, I also brought this one, German. which is the German dictionary, Warich Deutsches Wörterbuch. So let's see what it says about Sunday in this one. Sonntag, which is Sunday, der erste Tag der Woche. First the first day. day of the week. Ruetag. Interesting. It says it's the day of rest. Hmm. Isn't it interesting that they say this is the day of rest? Yeah, so they also continue where the other ones, at they least, don't define it as the first day, but they say it's a day of rest. Yes, yeah, so at least these three dictionaries, 
Even the Oxford there defines it as the first day of the week. I remember the old Afrikaans dictionary. It's also, it said, the first day of the week. But uh, I don't know what it says in the modern world. It probably says day after Saturday. Saturday. All right, so that was quite an eye-opener to me that the man could not find it and therefore I had to make alternative plans to show him <laughs> that it was indeed yeah. the first day we used of to, the week. Yeah, we used to previously say just go to a dictionary. Now he can't even do that anymore. I can't go there either anymore. So, okay, now we're just going to get to what are the plans? How are they going to implement this whole climate thing and Sunday rest, and where is it heading? They're going to link it to climate mm -hmm. because then they have a lever for the secular world, but they've already linked it to the religious world. Yeah. And they've done so very well in all their dictionaries, they define it as such. Exactly. So here you have Euroactive, 25 March 2022. Albanian cities to go car free one day a month to save fuel. In a bid to battle rising fuel prices and quell disquiet from citizens, the Albanian government has announced that as of 3 April, every city in the country will have a car-free day on the first Sunday of the month. This is like a chameleon, Martin. Chip. Chip. We need to reduce vehicle traffic as much as we can, and if we cannot avoid starting the car every day, at least do it on the holiday. That is why we start the car-free day plan from the first Sunday of every month. And eventually it will become every Sunday. Like they did in Europe. Work-free Sundays, once a month, and now I think up to today it's every single Sunday. Yes. Here's the Indian Express, March 25, 2022. Martin, these dates are important because people say that, you know, we rely on old news sometimes. Mm. This is pretty up to date, right? Yeah, it's recent. But there's no evidence of anything like this happening. We hear from very important quarters. That's it. And another thing that's also interesting is that certain countries do it a certain way. Other countries do it differently. Like, for instance, you remember the Arab countries instituted a four-day um, work week. Do you know what's interesting? I just read the United States is discussing exactly. a four-day work week. So they, they're putting on this rest. Yeah, you see, so it's very interesting. Different countries may be creeping up towards this in different ways. Absolutely correct. So here's the Indian Express, Mumbai, to host Sunday streets each week, some roads to remain shut for a few hours. Now, we all know that uh, the whole of India is starting to integrate its political system with the Hindu religion. Yes. There's quite a bit of resistance and argument on the issue, but... Why keep Sunday? There is no such thing in their religion. So obviously this is just following the lead of everyone else. From coming Sunday, March 27, for four hours every Sunday morning between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m., some of the roads in Mumbai will remain completely or partially shut for vehicular traffic. As part of Sunday Streets, an initiative started by Mumbai Police Commissioner Sanjay Pandey to allow the public to spend some quality time on the roads for recreational activities such as yoga, skating, cycling and other cultural sports. While replying to the people's comments on social media, Pandey said, Sunday streets is to make streets available to citizens with no moving traffic. You can come with families, play games, play music, ride bikes, do yoga. Pushing the recreational side. We'll see just later, but pushing the festivities. Having a festival, a wonderful get-together on a Sunday. Now, is it possible that they then will re introduce religious festivals as well? Yeah. This is a very interesting one. Sunday streets. Your street, your day. Sunday streets is San Francisco's open streets program 
that transforms miles of city streets into car-free community spaces for kids to play, seniors to stroll, businesses and organizations to connect, and neighbors to meet. Sunday Streets is returning in 2022 with six big, beautiful, mile-plus long routes in historic neighborhoods between April and September and the second annual Phoenix Day citywide on October 16, 2022. Now, this is the United States of America. Mm. So is this becoming a universal way of thinking? Definitely, and it's linked to climate change the whole time. And then also what makes it so much more interesting, if you're, even if you're maybe a climate skeptic, it brings in the rest. And let's, the, let's party. Yes, and have a wonderful time together and build our family relationships. Yes, so let's give new impetus to Sunday. And here's the European Times of the 3rd of March 2022. The European Sunday Alliance calls EU leaders to establish a European weekly common day of rest. The European Sunday Alliance calls on political leaders to establish a European weekly common day of rest. It strengthens the social cohesion of our communities and it is indispensable to recover and to ensure both a better well-being and productivity of workers, says the Alliance in a statement released on Wednesday, the 3rd of March, 2022. Is this discussion still ongoing? Definitely. It's, and it's current. On the occasion of the International Day of a Work-Free Sunday, the European Sunday Alliance, the EU political leaders to put as a priority the establishment of a European weekly common day of rest for workers by traditions on Sunday, as enshrined in Article 2 of the European Social Charter. A full day of rest per week is indispensable to recover and to ensure both a better well-being and a better productivity of workers and it strengthens the social cohesion of our community. Now, it's interesting, in the old days, when they first started pushing this agenda, and actually it went to the European court, mm. the court decided that there was no evidence that it had to be Sunday. So then they reintroduced the social order and the cohesion and also the time off to go to church, etc., etc., and said it had to be Sunday. So now this is the new initiative where all of these counter-arguments against the court's decision have been introduced. Yes, because it can almost sound, if we talk about this, that we are totally against family, families getting together and all this. No, no. We just say stating here what the agenda is. Yes. Moreover, he continues with the COVID-19 pandemic, the increasingly blurring of work-life balance and the accelerating of an always-on culture is essential more than ever to have a clear and common day of rest. See, it has to be a common day of yes, rest. that can accommodate everybody for the common good. For the common good. So here we have a clear agenda. Now, once you have all of this in play, and the climate agenda is the driving force behind it. You can shut down everything because of the climate agenda mm -hmm. to give a reason that is not purely religious. Then you bring in everything else. And then you have a little group that says, we are not going along with this. Martin, will you be the pariah of the world? Just as like if you go against the narrative currently about what's going on in the world. Well, let's read a quote from The Great Controversy. To prepare the way for the work which he designed to accomplish, Satan had led the Jews before the advent of Christ to load down the Sabbath with the most rigorous exactions, making its observance a burden. Now taking advantage of the false light in which he had thus caused it to be regarded, he cast contempt upon it as a Jewish institution. While Christians generally continued to observe the Sunday as a joyous festival, he led them in order to show their hatred of Judaism to make the Sabbath a fast, a day of sadness and gloom. 
That is what happened historically. Correct. So the Sunday was a day of joyous occasion. Mm -hmm. The Sabbath was a day of gloom. Yes. So they, that's what the devil brought in. In the early part of the 4th century, the Emperor Constantine issued a decree making Sunday a public festival throughout the Roman Empire. The Day of the Sun was reverenced by his pagan subjects and was honored by Christians. It was the Emperor's policy to unite the conflicting interests of heathenism and Christianity. He was urged to do this by the bishops of the church who, inspired by ambition and thirst for power, perceived that if the same day was observed by both Christians and heathen, it would promote the nominal acceptance of Christianity by pagans and thus advance the power and glory of the church. But while many God-fearing Christians were gradually led to regard Sunday as possessing a degree of sacredness, they still held the true Sabbath as the holy of the Lord and observed it in obedience to the fourth commandment. So this has been a strategy that has been coming a very long way. Exactly. And they've used, like we've seen now, this festivities, this, oh, we make it such a wonderful day that whenever somebody is against this day or not going along with it, you're the, becoming the enemy. So probably you will have public transport taking you to these festival streets without any traffic, and you can just have a fun day. Now, we've seen this part of the agenda, right? We've seen the agenda of the climate change being added on to the economic issue, to the political issues. Now, the Bible tells us that certain things will also transpire, mm. and Jesus told us what these things were in Matthew and the equivalent chapters in Mark and in Luke. So we have another problem today, and that is the issue of morality and gender. Mm. If we take the definition of a woman in the dictionary, it also becomes a very interesting feature because, as we know, people don't seem to know what a woman is anymore. No. And we had a Supreme Court nominee refusing to define what a woman is, and it doesn't stay there. The entire Biden administration refuses to define what a woman is, and it seems other countries are following suit. Now, Martin, what is your take on that issue? When they, for example, don't know what a woman is, well, what it, will that affect? I think it will make it then difficult to uphold women's rights. Yes, how do you uphold women's rights if you don't know what a woman is? And how do they then bring in equality? And they want to bring in women and equality into the workplace. But what is a woman? How do you make a woman equal if you don't know what a woman is? Well, the issue has certainly become blurred, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go back to our dictionaries. Merriam-Webster's dictionary said, A woman is an adult female person. And a man is an adult male human. <laughs> it's very interesting. So at least we're human, Martin. And uh, the female is a person. Now, a woman is a female. What is a female then? Well, it's a woman, right? There must be a problem then. <laughs> All right. Because so there's a male, male part in there. Or, oh, yes, because it says female. All right, so... If she is a female, but a female is a woman, then a woman must be a female. But if you can't define a woman, can you then define a female? No. No, right? Okay. Cambridge Dictionary. An adult female human being. An adult male human being. Macmillan Dictionary. An adult female person. An adult male human for a man. The Oxford Dictionary, an adult female human being, an adult male human being. At least they're consistent. Mm. And dictionary.com, an adult female person. And the man gets a very long definition. I wonder why it's so complicated to define a man. 
A man is a member of the species of humo, Homo sapiens or all the members of the species collectively without regard to sex. Very interesting. So if you use man generically, man, mankind, whatever. Mm, like the Bible actually. Uh, then you have uh, yes, a collective usage of the word. So is there any definition of what a woman is here really? No. So no. I can understand why it's probably difficult for them to give the definition. All right. So what is female in terms of woman? In, in, well, in my, in my way of thinking, what they've given is a synonym. But a synonym is not a definition. Genesis 1 verse 27, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female created he them. So the Bible is very clear. There are only two, and not over a hundred. I found that one so amusing <laughs> some time back when that uh, German parliamentarian insisted on reading all hundred and something definitions of gender, because the original was uh, you address gentlemen and ladies, but that was no longer acceptable because the German court had decided that there were at least a hundred or more definitions of what gender is. And so this parliamentarian found it appropriate to read all hundred, but he only had five minutes to speak. So he was very clever. He said, no, you've just made a law that there are a hundred, and therefore it is inappropriate to, for me to say, ladies and gentlemen, because that would be only two. But you've made a law that there are over a hundred, so I have to read all hundred of them, otherwise I'm discriminating against all the others. So you can only start the clock once my <laughs> introduction is over. That was brilliant. In any case... The Bible clearly says they were male and female, only two. In Genesis 6, verse 19, And every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. So this terminology uh, is not confined to the human race, mm. hmm? according it's, to the scriptures. That's how God created it. Let's listen to this discussion that took place in the confirmation hearings of the new Supreme Court member of Biden. Can you provide a definition for the word woman? Can I provide a definition? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I can't. You can't? Not in okay. this context. So I'm not a biologist. The meaning of the word woman is so unclear and controversial that you can't give me a definition. Senator, in my work as a judge, what I do is I address disputes. If there's a dispute about a definition, people make arguments, and I look at the right. law and I decide. Well, so I'm not. The fact that you can't give me a straight answer about something as fundamental as what a woman is underscores the dangers of the kind of progressive education that we are hearing about. So, Martin, is it only a Supreme Court nominee that doesn't know what a woman is? Unfortunately not. All right, here's an Australian Senate committee that is discussing the issue with the Department of Health. Let's see whether they can fare any better. Well, I'm going to finish up then, because this hasn't been very helpful, with a very simple question for the department, and that is one which has troubled me for a great deal of time with the bureaucracy here. Can someone please provide me with a definition of what a woman is? <coughs> department of Health. Definition of a man. Definition of a woman. Anyone? It's pretty basic. It's basic stuff. Professor Murphy. <laughs> there, look, I think there are, there are a variety of definitions. And I, I think Just a simple perhaps, one. Perhaps to give a, a more fulsome answer, we should take that on notice. You're going to take on notice yeah. the question of what a woman no, is. No, well, there, there are a variety. There, it, it's a very, it's a very 
uh, it's a very contested space at mm. the moment, Senator. It's not I just mean, a woman who was born a woman. But there are definitions That's in terms of how people identify themselves. So we're happy to provide our working that definition is on one of the, I'm, I've only been here two years. That's the best thing I've seen thus far. Thank you so much. Um. Martin, has the world gone insane? Well, I think what you used to know about when you were about two years or three years old, maybe they can ask the children. Yes, because when they say, boys this side, girls that side, there was no confusion in the past, right? Mm. So why do we mention this? Because there's an important sign in the Bible. And we read it in Luke 17 from verse 26. And it says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So that's the one side. Mm -hmm. And the Bible tells us what it was like in the days of Noah. People were constantly contriving evil. Evil, yes. Until the Lord decided it was time to eliminate humanity or else there would be no one left. But Luke continues and says, Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So Sodom and Gomorrah, act or play the part of a type, an example of the final destruction. Now, when we study what happened yes. there with Lot, we can see that the gender issue was a very prominent part of that narrative. Mm -hmm. So can we expect that the anti-type will have the same? Definitely. And I think if you just look at what legislation is starting to do, we are at the very point where it can't actually get any worse. All right. Now, we don't want to be so direct in this discussion, but if you look at the symbols and the symbolism that some of these alternative uh, viewpoints use to display their potential, particular uh, tendencies. Isn't it interesting that you find those same symbols also in the religious world? Mm -hmm. Let us leave it at that. So basically what we are seeing here is that we have all the issues that the Bible speaks about collectively coming together in exactly the way that the Bible says they would and that they are all present right now. Yes. So are we living in the last moments of this earth's history? I believe it. Yes. So is this something to be discouraged about, or is it time to lift up your heads and know that your redemption draweth nigh? That, that's exactly what we should do now. And when the day comes when this final clash will take, part, take place, where those that keep to the testimony of Jesus and keep the commandments of God will be opposed to this entire narrative that is built on sand. When that clash comes, then we are either on the side that says rocks fall on us and hide us from mm. the face of the Lamb, or they will say, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the table is laid. Everything is in place. We're just waiting for the final proclamations. They've come from organizations. 
They've come from the religious world. They've come from organizations pushing the agenda. All we need now is for the kings of the world to give their power unto the beast and to legislate the will of the beast as we have read in all of these documents. May the God of heaven give us wisdom to make right choices in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.